Okay, so today's lesson is section 2-7. It's called Doubling and Having. Okay, so before we get into that part, I want to give you an introduction. So we're going to start with a trip to Junior Assembly. And at Junior Assembly, Erin decided that she really liked the Mr. Pibb that they had. Now, I don't know if you know this, but 12 ounces of Mr. Pibb has 40 milligrams of caffeine in it. And because she was dancing so much, she decided she was going to drink one of the little six ounce cups of Mr. Pibb after every song. Ooh, she was very thirsty. So we have the number of songs that's going to be important and the amount of caffeine she's had. So after one song, she has a six ounce Mr. Pibb. How much caffeine is in her system? 20 milligrams. And then she goes out and dances through the second song. It's over. She drinks another six ounce Mr. Pibb. How much is in her system? 40. And then after the third song, she has another. And so that's 60 milligrams. And after the fourth song, she has another. So she now has 80 milligrams of caffeine. If I wanted to write an equation for how much caffeine is in her system after S number of songs, what would I do? Yep, the caffeine is equal to... 20 times the number of songs. What kind of an equation is that that we've talked about already this year? Direct variation. Direct variation and linear, right? We know it's linear because there is a constant difference. The difference here is 20, 20, 20, and the constant difference here is 1. So as long as there's a constant difference there, we know it's going to be linear. That means that the rate of change is constant. That's the slope, right? The slope has to stay the same. So this is an example of direct variation that is linear. Now, that's the way she was putting the caffeine in her system. The way caffeine leaves your system is not the same. If all I did was take a, a cup that had water in it and drill a hole in the bottom of it and I watched the, the water leave the cup, that would be a linear equation because it would be draining at a rate of so many ounces per a certain amount of time, like an ounce per minute or something like that, depending on the size of the hole. Caffeine doesn't leave your body that way. Caffeine has a half-life of about five hours in a healthy adult. So a half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the caffeine in your system to be gone. So that's how long it takes for half of the caffeine in your system to be gone. Let's look at what happens. We're going to build a table and I'll show you how half-life works through using the table. You want kind of a big spot in the middle because that's where we're going to write our process. And over here, we're going to have the number of half-lives. And over here, we're going to have caffeine left in our system. Okay. So we have how many half-lives have happened. And each half-life is how long? How many hours? Five hours. So as soon as she has stopped drinking the caffeine, that's when we're going to measure from. At that moment when she has stopped drinking, we're at zero half-lives because nothing, no time has passed at all, so no half-lives have passed. And there's how much caffeine in her system as soon as she's done? 80 milligrams. So that's in the beginning. Wait, question. Yes. Would, it be, would you do it like after every song? Because she technically stopped drinking and then... We're going to say that because four songs is less than 20 minutes, 
Yeah. And it's five hours is a whole half life. It's not going to have a huge effect. Does he have a fourth cup of mustard spread in the Yes. She was very thirsty. Okay. So five hours later, how many half lives have occurred? One. So that means the amount of caffeine in her system has been cut in half once. And I want you to write 80 times one half. I know you could write divided by two, but I want this to say times a half for the purpose of what we're doing. So when it's been cut in half once, how much caffeine is in her system? 40. 40. So that's five hours later, she still has 40 milligrams of caffeine in her system. Wait, so instead of, so instead of just getting rid of that altogether, like another half life, would it be Cutting that one in half? Yes. So, so 10 hours happen? later, 10 hours later, how many half lives have happened? Two. Two. That means it's been cut in half and then cut in half again. So that is 80 times one half times one half. So half of 80 is 40, and half of that 40 is 20. That's just not how it works. So does caffeine ever actually leave your body? That's a good question. What about 15 hours later? How many half-lives have occurred? Three. Three. So it's been cut in half how many times? Three times. So times a half, times a half, times a half, which puts us at 10. Let's do one more. What about 20 hours later? That's almost a full day. 20 hours is how many half-lives? Four. four. So that means it's been cut in half four times. Which is, now we're down to five milligrams. What if I said 40 hours later? Well, you can divide one in each of us, and that is in between five, five, right? This isn't linear. It's not. Mm -mm. So we can't compare these two together. How many half lives have happened? Eight. Good. Um, but I'm going to say I don't have space to write eight one half. So how could I write that instead? Hmm? 80 times one half to the eighth. So grab your calculator. Okay. Let me get this part in. Point three one two five. So the, this, this all has to do with the way your body processes a drug. Like caffeine is a drug, right? Um, your body processes all, Tylenol, allergy medicine, all those other medications that you, that you take, they all have half-lives. And so there's... Is working for so long? Yes. So the medications that, that you, don't, you only have to take like once a day, the half-life is much longer on that. It stays in your system longer. It just is not a linear kind of relationship. So the way I give you a visual for this is if I, if I take this guy right here, and I want to march him halfway across the board. Can I do that? OK, that puts him right about like here. OK. Halfway again, so where does that put him? Here, nope, that's halfway, right here. Then he goes halfway again. Well, now he's right here. Yes. Now, he's getting closer and closer to the edge of the board, right? 
just like the amount of the caffeine in your system is getting closer and closer to what? Zero. Closer to zero. Is it going to reach zero if I keep cutting it in half and in half and in half and in half? So the whole, one of the big studies that you do in calculus has to do with limits. When a number is getting really, really close to something, but it's not actually going to reach it. The amount of caffeine in your system, mathematically speaking, mathematically speaking, can't ever really reach zero once you put it in your system. Now, are you still feeling the effects of that Coke you had last summer? No. Can we even, if you had a Coke last summer and haven't had any caffeine since then, would we even be able to detect it in your blood? No. So, for all realistic purposes, the caffeine eventually does leave your system. If it's a parabola, it has to decrease and then do what? Is this going to increase? No. What's the only way for your caffeine level to increase? Yeah. You to take more. That's what you do with Tylenol. If you're in pain and you take Tylenol, and then the amount of Tylenol, your body processes that Tylenol, right? So first it works, and then the amount of Tylenol decreases to a point where you don't feel it anymore. And what do you do when you don't feel it anymore? You take some more. And then you wait until you don't feel it anymore, and then you take some more. And it kind of builds. We're going to get there. Yep. So why is it um, this um, well, because I jumped from 4 to 8. Oh, okay. That's why. We, it would have gone to 2.5 and then 1.25 and then, yeah. Yes and no, but your body can tolerate a great deal. Of, most people's bodies can tolerate a great deal of caffeine. Now, it changes the chemical makeup of your body and how your, your brain functions and all kinds of things. But if you look, there are a lot of adults who drink a great deal of coffee every day, and there's more caffeine in coffee than there is in soda. So, yes, there's a buildup of it in your system and how long it stays there. Is questionable. I, don't, I haven't studied it. But this is how it processes. This is how your body processes it. All right, so let's erase our little man who's done walking across the board. And let's talk about this equation. When we're writing an equation, we look for what changes and what stays the same. Okay? So in this problem here with our songs, the number of songs was changing, so that was a variable. Then the amount of caffeine was changing, so that was a variable, right? Where did this 20 come from? So that was the piece of it that was staying the same. When you look at this, what's changing? The half-lives is changing. What else is changing? Caffeine level. What's staying the same? The 80. And kind of? Kind of the one half, but like Kind of the one half. But what's changing about the one half is how do I decide how many of them I need? Half-lives. It's the number of half-lives. Two half-lives. Two half-lives. So the amount of caffeine I have in my system is dependent on how many half-lives have occurred. The more half-lives that occur, the less caffeine is in my system. So is the half-lives Yes. So, the eight eight so to find the caffeine in your system, you do 80 times 1 half to the H. The H and the C are my variables. For this, 80 is the initial amount that we have. And we'll talk about how this goes with the, with the, with, we'll generalize this in a minute. But for now, we're going to talk about just this one. Okay. We're going to graph this. So I want you to draw a graph. First, before we start graphing it, I want you to think about what quadrant we're going to be in. 
What quadrant should we be in? What quadrant is that? Okay. No. Oh, okay. Look at all of your numbers that you have in your table. And they are, they're all positive. And we said, can this get to zero, the caffeine level? No. Not mathematically speaking. Could it be negative? No. no. So that's how we know we only want that positive, positive quadrant, where our x's are positive and our y's are positive. So our x is half-lives. Oh, dear. I'm just trying to write with the line tool. Half lives. And over here we have caffeine. What is the highest amount of caffeine that Aaron had in our system? 80. So we need to go up to at least 80. If I count by fives, will it fit? 40, no, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 80, 40, 40, 60. What do we want to count by for the half-lives? How many half-lives did we get to? Eight. So we don't have to count quite as high. Yeah, we could just count by ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Remember that your two scales don't need to be the same, but this does need to be zero. So let's plot our first point. When the number of half-lives was zero, how much caffeine was in our system? 80. So that's the what for the graph. What do we call that point? The that's the y-intercept. And what does it represent? Where did we get that number 80? That's how much caffeine we started off with. That's how much caffeine we started off with. Yes. Oh. Oh. We started with. Remember that you need to be able to explain that point using words from the problem. You could have said, that's how much caffeine she drank at JA. You could but you needed to address that the 80 was the amount of caffeine that we started with somehow, okay? After one half-life, how much caffeine was in our system? 40. 40. After two? After three? After four? After eight? Point three one two. I want this to be linear. But it is not. It sounds like it should be. No, it's, 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 it's mm -hmm. Good observation. So it looks, we've, we've said two different graphs so far. You all, first someone said, is it a parabola? And we said, well, it would have to decrease and then increase. And we know it's not going to increase again. When we learned about hyperbolas, we learned that they don't touch either x or y axis, but we just saw that it does touch the y axis. But does it touch the x axis? No. no. This is just called an exponential graph. It doesn't have a special name. It's an exponential graph or an exponential equation. An equation that has a variable as the exponent. So if we draw this, our line had to come from over here, right, and cross through. So it's coming from up here. Oh, 
it was originally in quadrant two. Now for us, that doesn't make any sense because that meant x was negative. And can we have a negative number of half-lives? No. But can you have a negative exponent? Yes. So our equation is y equals 80 times 1 half to the x. So mathematically speaking, we can plug in negatives for x. It works. We get answers, right? It just wouldn't make sense with the problem. Right. It wouldn't make sense with the problem. For us, it starts at 80. Yes. So that's not in this problem. All that was was the building up of the caffeine in her system so that we could compare the difference between a linear and, and a nonlinear. Uh, so we didn't have to do that. No. Okay. So the table is not a part of the equation. Okay. This table. It's, but this table, no, this table was just as a comparison tool. Yeah, this is the focus right here. So if I say 30 hours from now, how much caffeine is in her system in 30 hours? Don't tell me how, but can you do that? Okay. So what if I want to know how to figure out when her caffeine level is down to 30 milligrams? Hmm, that's interesting. We do, well, uh, I like the idea. We know that 30 is which variable? Y, but where is X in the equation? It's in the exponent. So that's first of all how I know it's an exponential equation. It has that X up there. But the way you solve when X is in an exponent is by using logarithms. Logarithms, which we're not going to learn this year. So we're going to take the easy route instead of trying to learn logarithms to solve this. We want to know when Y equals 30. So I want you to write down y equals 30. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to graph both of these equations on our calculator. Can we not do the variable 80, 1 half 80? Nope. What does the line y equals 30 look like? It's a horizontal line. So when we get this graph, we should have a line coming through like this, right? And this point right here is the point that we're looking for. Okay, so we're going to go to y equals and we're going to put in both of those equations. 80 times 1 half to the x. Be sure you use the exponent key there. Otherwise, you're going to get a line instead of a curve. And we wanted to know when y equals what? 30. 30. Now, when you graph it, am I getting a very nice picture here? Okay, we've got to fix the window. So everybody hit window, and I want you to think about the scales that we just chose. Looking here, what was our domain? Zero to eight. Zero to eight. What was our range? Zero to eighty. Okay, so we're going to change the domain and range on here also. X minimum, 8, X maximum, 10 is fine. 10 half-lives, 10 doubling periods for today. 0 to 10 is a fine domain for all of the problems that you do. Um, mm -hmm. Our Y max, we said, should be... We could do 100. It was at, Ours was set at 80, but 100 isn't a bad choice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so once you have this picture on your calculator, you want to find right where they intersect. Write down these keystrokes. 
you need to hit second. And then the trace key. Do you see where above trace it says calc? Yeah. It's going to calculate this for you. It's going to find the exact spot. You want to find out where those lines do what? Five. Intersect. So you're going to hit five. And it's going to ask you three questions. What's the first question? First curve question mark. The answer is enter. Then it says second curve. And your answer is enter. Then it says guess. And your answer is enter. Then it should say the intersection point is 1.4 comma 30. That means when y is 30, x has to be 1.4150375. When y is 30, x has to be about 1.4. So if we wanted where y is 30, x is going to be about 1.4. Because that's what that order pair is, 1.4 comma 30. And then you solve it. Then that's only telling us how many half-lives. What we really want is time. So we've got to convert from half-lives back to time. You times it by five. So we multiply that by five to get from. So after about seven hours, her caffeine level is down to 30 milligrams. So what you're copying down from the book, this is on page 108, is the equation and a graph and what everything represents. What does Y represent according to the book? What does it say? So it's the amount of whatever substance it is after X half-lives. Yes. What is A? What does it say in your book that A is? The original amount. So that was the amount of caffeine she took in. That's the original amount. And then what is X? X is Do you notice that time doesn't go in here? Right, you've got to be able to convert back and forth between the number of half-lives and time. But the actual time itself, 5 hours, 20 hours, isn't going to go into your equation. You have to change it to half-lives first. And then yes, your y-intercept is always going to be whatever your initial starting amount is. Okay, the other thing that we're going to talk about is doubling. Some substances double over time. Okay, and in fact, we're going to look at an example in your book where there is a landfill that they say is doubling every three years. Well, the, only, the biggest difference with doubling is it's doing what? It's getting bigger instead of getting smaller. So your equation for that is y equals a times 2 to the x. Instead of cutting it in half, we're going to double it every time. A is still the initial amount, or the original amount. Y is the amount after X doubling periods, just like it was X half-lives, now it's X doubling periods. And then the last one is X, which instead of being the number of half-lives, is the number of doubling periods. Yes? And what would you call two? It doesn't have a specific name, but it's there because it's doubling. It's the rate, I guess you could say. It's the rate at which it's growing, and it's Double. Okay, so what I want us to do is we're going to look at that example on page, look with me to page 106. And when you look at page 106, what I want you to look for is how much trash is in the landfill to begin with when you look at that. 
50,000 what? Cubic. Cubic meters. So where is that going to go in our equation? A, because it's the starting amount, it's the initial amount. It happens to also be Y for the very beginning, but it's always going to be A, all right? What is the doubling period for this landfill, do they think? Three years. Now, I'm not going to put the three years in my equation, but I need to know it so I can convert from time to the number of doubling periods. So I've got Y equals 50,000 cubic meters times 2 to the X. And they want to know how much trash is in the landfill or what they expect to be in the landfill after 24 years. Well, we said a doubling period is how long? Three years. So if it's been 24, how many doubling periods have occurred? Eight. So where am I going to plug that eight? And for X. X is my number of doubling periods. So Y equals 50,000 times 2 to the eighth. What is that? That's it. Oh, that's two to the eighth. Fifty thousand times two to the eighth. Oh, I know. Two to the eighth. Uh, twelve million eight hundred thousand cubic meters. That's a lot of that's a lot of trash. What if I wanted to know how long it would take the landfill to get to um, twenty two twenty million cubic meters? So then you plug in twenty million for y. Can I, if I plug it in here, can I solve algebraically for x? Yeah. What do I have to do? Yeah. I have to graph it. So we need both of our equations in here. Graph your initial equation. Huh. Well, that's not good. See if we can open it again. Well, mine's not going to do it. Can you guys get it on yours? Are you going to have to change your window a little bit? We want to plug this. This is our equation that we're plugging in. Oh. This one and this one. What should our domain be for number of doubling periods? Zero to what? Three. What did I tell you would work for all the problems we're doing today? Eight. Ten. Yep. Then we start at 50,000 and we go up from there. And I want to know when we get to 20 million. So what does my y max need to be? It needs to be more than 20 million. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to see it. So maybe 25 million? Because if I do it at 20 million, that's going to be the very top of my graph, and I'm not going to be able to see the line. Because what is when I graph y equals 20 million, what does that look like? A straight line at 20 million. What does the other one look like? Have you gotten a picture yet? Zero. I can't see it. 
So we're looking for this point right here, and when we calculate it on our calculator, we get that it's 8.6, and that's where it's 20 million. So it takes 8.6 doubling periods to reach 20 million. Yes? What was the Y? 25 million. Okay, just to wrap it up, I'll, t I'll look at your calculator. We're, we have to do 8.6 times the three years in order to get how long it's going to take, which is 25.8. And 25.8 years. Years. For it to reach that capacity. So the volume into one question, and the answer to that would be the 20 this the amount of trash in the landfill is doubling every three years. Yeah. That's what they're saying. That's just that's just what it says. No, because it's not growing by the same amount every year. Linear means you're growing by the same amount every year. Exponentially is it's doubling, it's growing really fast. Okay, let's talk about that some more. I'm gonna wrap up the video. This is the end here, and so now you're gonna do the work from your from your textbook.